Welcome to Sunday morning at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Danny Deeth, and in our recent past, we have welcomed the newborn king into the world. We have watched as the shepherds and the angels and the magi all sought to put themselves into the presence of Christ. We do that today as we come together to worship and to celebrate and then seek to do that every day for the rest of our lives. Let's take this journey together. We are so glad you're here. Come on in. Our first scripture lesson is from the book of the prophet Micah in the sixth chapter, verses one to eight. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the case of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth for the Lord has a case against his people and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I worried you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortals, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson is from Matthew 5, 1 through 12. These are what we know as the Beatitudes. So I invite you to listen again with fresh ears. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. December 24th, 1986. Oliver Stone directed a movie called Platoon. Platoon was historical fiction, but it was based on Oliver Stone's account as a soldier in Vietnam. And he came back and fashioned this movie from his experience. And the, the plot centers around a young Charlie Sheen, his name is Chris Taylor. 
He volunteered. He left his Ivy League school, went against his family, and volunteered for service to serve in Vietnam. He is green. He is right from the world. And quickly he learns how to survive the difficulty of what the war conditions are. The two other central figures are Staff Sergeant Barnes, played by Tom Berenger, and the other is Sergeant Elias, it's his first name, played by Willem Dafoe. And uh, my Army military friends tell me that Staff Sergeant is E6 and Sergeant is E5. That means that uh, Tom Berenger's character is in charge of the platoon and Sergeant Elias is in charge of a squad within the platoon. And both, I got a thumbs up, thank you, military friends. And these are both strong personalities. These are both excellent soldiers. And the dynamics are contrasting between these two leaders, again, as Charlie Sheen's character is figuring out how to be in this place and do what he volunteered to be there to do amidst all of the horror and challenge of that place. Tom Berenger's role, his character, who again uh, was a staff sergeant, he was in charge of the platoon, he was ruthless, he was efficient, right and wrong was more clear, he often took innocent life in order to achieve his goals. To contrast, Willem Dafoe's character, Sergeant Elias, had more discerning spirit about morality in that terrible environment. It was two polar opposites, although they were all called to do the same thing and a part of the same platoon. And at times, Charlie Sheen's character, again, Green just stepped into this zone. He spends time with each one, things happen. And all the way through the movie, Charlie Sheen is writing his grandmother, not his parents, because they don't support him leaving and they're what to do. And so we know what's going on in his mind. And he says, Grandma, at times I feel like I'm being pulled between two fathers. The implication being two spiritual different worlds represented by these two strong characters that he has to interact with. He can't just turn away from one and go to the other because they're in the same combat situation. He has to work and deal with both as both have authority over him. And he is pulled between these two worlds. I remember seeing Platoon with my dad. I've never been in a movie setting quite like that. There were Vietnam vets. There were several rows in there. And I'll never forget the gravity of when it was over. Nobody said a word. Not a word. The theater was full. I saw someone trying to wipe tears from his eyes and not be seen. It was moving and it was powerful. I can't hear Adagio for strings without that closing scene where Tom Berenger's character eventually shoots Elias because he witnessed him doing war atrocities to the natives in the village around them. The rest of the platoon is, is retreating and being taken away in a helicopter and they look down and there's Elias who is not dead but running from a whole section of the Vietnamese army who they watch kill him. The movie is a struggle and there is an undercurrent of what does it mean to be good and bad when you are pulled in these different directions with having to live in that environment with these two opposite forces. Today we enter the Gospel of Matthew 
into this same dichotomy, the same polarized understanding of what kingdom we're in and who do we serve. So the gospel of Matthew, what do we know? First of the four gospels, it bridges a lot of the Old Testament. When I say Matthew, it helps me to say the name Matthew. Matthew, because he was writing to a largely Jewish audience, he is largely trying to justify Jesus as the Messiah and the fulfillment of all of what we call the Old Testament, their Hebrew Bible, all of those prophecies coming true in Christ. The very first thing Matthew starts with is the one thing that when you come and you read and worship, you hope you don't get. It is the genealogy, all the begats of, of those days. Why does Matthew start with that? Because he is connecting Christ through the house of David to the lineage of their Jewish ancestors to prove again that this is the Messiah. Starts with the genealogy, proving and that Christ is the fulfillment of what they had been looking for. Then we know the few things that have happened. We are in chapter five here. So we know then Matthew's account of the birth story. It was wise men and the star. Then Jesus grows up, eventually baptized and sent into the wilderness in chapter four. And then at the end of that wilderness, Jesus calls the first disciples, and that's when we come into chapter five. So those key things are happened. Jesus is now starting to move. And as our verse starts in five, at the end of four, it also says that he was starting to draw a crowd, that he had gone to preach in the synagogues, he was casting out demons, he was healing, he was teaching, he was doing all those things that made people say, oh, something is going on here. This guy has some kind of extraordinary power in his teaching, in his healings. So there was following that was starting. Crowds had started to follow him. So into that comes chapter five. And Matthew chapter five through seven, I want you to spend some time on and focus on. This is what we call Sermon on the Mount. And these chapters are key to our Christian understanding of who Jesus is and therefore who we are, what we are being called to do, and how we are to get there. Chapters five through seven contain so much of our Christian understanding. We start with the Beatitudes, that's what I read today. And then we move to you are the salt, you are the light of the world. There are other familiar passages in here, judge lest ye not be judged. The Lord's Prayer, knock and you will find. It's more and more and more of these little jewels. Do not store on earth treasure. Five through seven is key. So where are the Beatitudes in the Bible? Matthew five through seven. Say it with me, Matthew five through seven. And that's what? Sermon on the Plain, yes, yeah, starting with the Beatitudes, right. And if you don't know any other scripture, I want you to know those chapters because they are key and again, contain so much of what we know to be the core of our faith. So it begins here. And interestingly enough, Jesus is with the crowds that have assembled and Jesus steps away from them. So this Sermon on the Mount is not addressed to the crowd. It says, he turned and spoke to the disciples and he sat down with them. 
That was the posture of a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, how they would teach. They would sit with those gathered around them, Jesus claiming that role for himself, and started to teach them about what? About the kingdom of God. This begins the first of what we call the five discourses in Matthew. And these disciples were just called. Put yourself in their place. They had grown up in another faith, in another religion. They were now following this guy, and we don't have a sense of the timeline, how long they had been following at this point, but again, long enough for Jesus to teach and preach and travel and start to stir the pot and draw a crowd. But now Jesus is intentionally sitting down with them and saying, this is why I am here. This is what I am calling you to And this is what I need you to continue to do. He is coming to establish the kingdom in this newly inaugurated community. So Jesus called the disciples. They were the first to start this kingdom on earth. That will also be our kingdom in heaven. The gospel of Matthew is key about this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven. When you think of all the parables in Matthew, they all start with the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. And Jesus starts here to start to train and or retrain these disciples to see that there's a different kingdom than the world offers and they are called to it. And Christ at his birth is now starting to build that kingdom. We look at these two kingdoms before we even get into our passage. And we know that just as Chris Taylor, Charlie Sheen's character was in his platoon, he couldn't escape one or the other. At times, If you want to put it in these simple terms, he was bad and sinful and more morally bankrupt with Tom Berenger's character than with Willem Dafoe's. But he spent time over here and there was more peace and more patience, but he could not escape either one. And I want to start us to say the temptation is for us to say, okay, well, I just need you, blessed are the, okay, well, I'll just try harder to be that in the world. That, that's not what this is about. Just trying harder is not what this is about. It's a reorientation to understand that there is a kingdom of the world and there is a kingdom of God. God's kingdom is both here and in the afterlife and the kingdom of the world is also very present. And we cannot escape one to be in the other unless we become monks and fully remove ourselves from the day-to-day workings of our lives, job, school, family. So then the, the challenge becomes, how do we integrate these two or how do we see which kingdom has dominance? So part of your homework for today is to look at the kingdom of God through Christ and the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world says, what is success? Money, status, power, comfort, all the things that have to do with us, distracting ourselves away from what we know God is calling us to do versus Christ's kingdom. Christ's kingdom then starts with these beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And kind of the rough formula is that there is something that we consider negative and that ends as a positive. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Meek, inherit the earth. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, be filled. Merciful, receive mercy. Pure in heart, see God. Peacemakers, be called children of God. And then those who are persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Note that the first and the last ones, poor in spirit and those who were persecuted, end with the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The ones in the middle start with a negative and move to a positive, but it is bookended with the two things that specifically mention the kingdom of God. And yes, you Monty Python's fans, yes, blessed are the cheesemakers. Go ahead, you can giggle. I saw you. I saw some of you giggling when I read it. The first one, I believe, is the most important. We cannot spend time on all of these. This is a several months worth of preaching on all of this. But I think the first is the most important and incorporates, compasses the rest. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what does that mean? Poor in spirit. Well, I think often if you are economically challenged, you say, well, I don't have stuff, but I am rich in the spirit, poor in things, and those who are, are economically more comfortable might say, well, I have things, I am rich there, but I could be poor in spirit. But both of those are faulty, is faulty reasoning. I don't believe this is about stuff. I don't believe the poor in this is about what we have and what we don't have. I believe this is fully about admitting and recognizing that we are poor in spirit, that we cannot do it on our own, that we have to realize that we are helpless and we have to trust God. All the others are under that umbrella. Justice, kindness, walk humbly with our God, our Micah passage. Cassie talked about it. All of that fits under here. If we don't recognize, and recognition is the key, if we don't ever stop and evaluate where we are in our journey with Christ, then we can't realize what's dominating us. Again, which way are we being pulled? More to the kingdom of this world or more to the kingdom of Christ. And again, there's interplay every day, every moment. But we have an advantage over Charlie Sheen's character with his two opposite leaders in that we are being called to empty ourselves, submit ourselves to Christ, and that should be the world in which we live our lives. And the kingdom of the world, those things come in and out. Sometimes we give in, sometimes we don't. That is, again, a daily, if not minute-to-minute -minute challenge. But the key here is to realize that we are poor in spirit, meaning our spirit can't do it on its own. Our spirit can't get there on its own. And we then have to fully rely on God. We have to realize our helplessness, that we cannot become more holistic. We cannot be more healthy spiritually unless we admit first that our spirits are poor and we need God's help, helplessness, reliance on God. The word blessed, I know we think it means happy and it can, but I ran across some other translations. Spiritually prosperous are those who dot, dot, dot. It is to be enlarged, meaning we grow when we do these things. Even saw one who substituted the word healthy. Healthy. I don't want us to misunderstand that we're not just here to be blessed by God and accept all of the things. Well, I'm blessed when this happens and that happens and I can make my checklist off of these nine things. But rather, these 
Beatitudes are here for our spiritual health, guidance, and growth that we are to participate fully that helps us put the kingdom of God at the center of who we are and then start to build that kingdom which is in often opposition to the kingdom of the world. So that's it for today. So again, your homework is to go home and look at your life, look at your time, look at your resources, look at your soul, your spirit, your heart, and see which kingdom you are more aligned. And then realize that we are all poor in spirit unless we realize that we cannot do it on our own. And then we trust the risen Christ to come and to make us whole. And then like those disciples, we're called to build brick by brick Christ's kingdom on this earth so it more reflects God's grace, peace, hope, love, resurrected joy, and glory. Hallelujah. Amen.